Wicked. Brr, here we are <laughs> with uh, Tom Cronin. How are you, Tom? I'm great. It's good to be here, man. Awesome. Thanks Saturday you. night. Uh, it's a good place to be on a Saturday night. Ah, uh, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, <laughs> I enjoy that. I enjoy especially like full moons and yeah. when, you know, Friday, Saturday night when people are out there getting crazy. Uh, I, I like, mm. I feel that energy in the field and I, I, I like to, you know, almost channel it and use that energy for creativity and things like this. Yeah, um, yeah, you know, yeah. really, really uh, channel that into some actual uh, productivity or proactivity, you know? Yeah, for sure. Right. I'm sure you could have been uh, many places, so thanks for <laughs> taking, <laughs> taking the time to spend it with us. It's good to be, man. Awesome. Um, I'd love uh, for you to just introduce yourself briefly. Tell the people who don't know who you are or what you're about. Uh, yeah, just a quick intro. It'd be awesome. Yeah, sure. So Tom Cronin, I'm founder of the Stillness Project. Uh, we set the Stillness Project up about four years ago. Uh, I've got a great team around me. And uh, yeah, I was inspired by the changes that I went through with meditation. And I was a broker in finance for 26 years. And uh, the first 10 years of that was very Wolf of Wall Street. And the last 16 years of that was... Yeah, it was pretty wild. And then the last 16 years, that was, you know, it was very Zen. You know, I became much a Zen broker. So uh, after a while, you know, those many years passed and I just felt so moved by the power of meditation. I literally wanted to bring it to the world. And under the Stillness Project, you know, we had a vision to bring meditation to a billion people's lives and inspire a billion people to embrace meditation on a daily basis. So everything we do is pretty much revolving around that from coaching programs, retreats, uh, weekend workshops. I just came from a work workshop just now, actually, and teaching a group of people how to meditate. So it's really what inspires me the most. Amazing. And what does that entail, uh, teaching someone to meditate? It's something I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm familiar with and, and I love uh, doing myself, but also going in and, and learning other ways and methods as well. So for you, what does that entail when you teach uh, meditation to the, to the... Yeah, the way I teach it is using a particular sound or mantra, these ancient primordial vibrations that uh, I teach the attendees of the workshop, how to actually use. And when I say how to use, that's just one aspect of the, the training, which is teaching them how to meditate using that sound. But there's a lot of knowledge that supports that because they need to understand uh, the mechanics of the actual technique and why their physiology is going to have all sorts of crazy sensations during their meditation. You know, we just had 12 people after that course and you know, amongst that group, we had people with sore necks and, you know, um, you know, sore throats and throbbing headaches and, you know, some of them having sweats appear on their head, you know, as all during... Throughout the... Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, there's just so much purification. And so they need to really understand that mechanical process. So a lot of knowledge is shared in that workshop where they get a really deep understanding about how to meditate, when to meditate, where to meditate, but also the mechanics of meditation, why they're going to have lots of thought. So uh, we, I share a lot of knowledge in that workshop so they really deeply understand um, it all. Otherwise, a lot of people just think, oh, it's not working for me, you know. And that's a one day or is it a weekend or how does it work? I do a weekend workshop, yeah. So that's continuing tomorrow? Yeah, we do, uh, we do Saturdays and Sundays. Uh, it's four sessions, two on Saturday and two on Sundays generally most of the time. Cool. And just to give a, like, can you give a quick overview, a summary of what, uh, you know, some of the things that the, the deep knowledge that you are sharing, just so can you bullet point it for us? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, firstly, that your meditation experience is going to be diverse. Uh, it's going to put the physiology in a profoundly deep state of rest when the mind becomes still, and that's going to unlock deep stresses. And these stresses are going to start to purify and, and release through the body. And when we do this regularly over time, what happens is the body starts to get clearer and clearer and clearer, which gives you deeper and deeper access to a source that's within you that has been impeded by all the blockages and the stresses. And when those blockages and stresses have been removed, you start to go deeper and channel into something more profound within you and you access more love, more love, uh, more light, more consciousness, more knowledge. And mm -hmm. it's all within us. It's just that, it's just, you know, there's so many blocks to accessing that. So what's the first thing that you, that you present in that first session on the Saturday? First thing we do before anything else is teach them to meditate. Number one, uh, I, I really don't do any coaching uh, or anything until we get people meditating, until they can start to get out of the limitations of the pre-recorded thoughts in their head, um, the limited belief systems, uh, the stresses in the physiology. Um, the blockages around the heart. It's, I really find it almost, well, it's very difficult to work with someone 
until we can break them free of all that. And like Einstein says, it's very um, challenging to solve a problem with the same level of thinking that created the problem. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, we start with meditation number one. I give them their sound, their mantra based upon when they were born, and then uh, and then we get them meditating from the get go. Big big thing first up. Cool. And then, so do, do many people come in thinking that they can't meditate or they're doing it wrong, like yeah, you mentioned? Absolutely. Yeah. So many. It's amazing. You know, they come out of it and they go, "Did I just sit there for twenty minutes <laughs> and not like look at my phone?" You know, they just really can't believe, and it's just. It's the power of the mantra, you know. It's just it's the fact that the mind has something that it lures it. It, it, it entertains the mind, and the repetition of that sound with the mantra is, has a very powerful effect on the mind. And you know, otherwise the mind is just going to be flapping from thought to thought. It's going to be constantly bouncing around, and it's very difficult to meditate by just trying to still the mind. You know, it's just not something the mind wants to do, and it'll put up a lot of resistance. Hundred percent. I'm I'm a big. Uh believer in the breath i use the breath for that same thing yeah nice beautiful um, yeah yeah so it's a vehicle you know the breath becomes a vehicle so it's great it's a great tool yeah, i know a lot of people may you know might have a an image of of their master or you know that their, their, their teacher or um a candle yeah. or you know some incense or you know just something to to bring it back that one that concentration um, concentration yeah is what sort of the anat the anatomy of, of meditation like how would you break it down Mm, it's a good question. Uh, it's going to be different for different techniques. And, you know, I've been studying meditation for 20 years now and the various methods of meditating. And they're so diverse. And, um, you know, there's so many different ways to teach it. And uh, for me, you know, what I found most effective for me and the one for my students that, that I teach is with this mantra. And just simply, it's quite, you know, I had one student just today saying, you know, is my meditation going to get better? I said, your life will get better, but the meditation won't change that much. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been meditating 20 years and sometimes they're deep just they were on the first weekend. Yeah. Sometimes they're really shallow with lots of thoughts. Um, you know, the meditations themselves haven't changed that much in 20 years, but my experience of life has changed significantly. In, so, in what kind of ways? Uh, less reactive, uh, finding amongst the fluctuations of life a consistency. We call it being, there's a Sanskrit phrase, Yogastha Kurukamani, established in being, perform action. So there's a general consistency that allows you to... <laughs> Can you slow that one down for us? Can you repeat that? Yeah, Yogastha Kurukamani. Yogastha Kurukamani. Yogastha Kurukamani. Kurukamani, awesome. Established in being, perform action. And it's like a tree that grows... Being, perform... Perform Action. Action. So it's like uh, a tree that grows a deep root base and it gets buffered by winds every now and then. And these winds will come and it will really challenge the stability of that tree. But if the deep root base is deep enough and stable enough, uh, the tree will bend and sway, but it won't snap and fall over. And for a lot of us, we're not stabilizing in being, we're not, we're building our, our lives on a very shallow basis, thinking that the external world is the source of life and reality and fulfillment, which is what I did for many years. And uh, I got bowled over by the elements <laughs> very easily. And, uh, and that led to extreme stress responses that were very unpleasant. So that's what inspired me to create a deep root base in, mm. in the stillness and, and make that become... Uh, something that I'm grounded in so that when the challenges do present themselves and they will, they will, they do. Um, doesn't matter how much of a yogi meditating monk you are, you're still going to have challenges and you're still going to get buffered by the elements. So it's a matter of being prepared for that and being able to move through that with some level of um, you know, stability. And do you care to share some of that, uh, the stresses and, and the, the, what brought you to, to the meditation in the first place? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I had, I had extreme, extreme stress responses from the lifestyle choices that I was making. I was working as a broker and that was incredibly mm -hmm. intense. Just the job itself, which was, you know, on a phone trading beans of dollars and swaps and bonds every day on international markets. And, um, you know, it was a very intense uh, fight, flight, sympathetic nervous system state that you're in day in, day out, year after year. 
but then it was nighttime, you know, you'd be out and lunch times, you know, client lunches, Martha's marketing, marketing at marketing at dinner, instantly, a lot of drinking, a lot of drugs, uh, a lot of partying weekends. I got caught up in the whole eighties, nineties rave culture. I was, you know, trudging through the city and late Saturday nights, finding warehouse parties with thump and bass sound systems and be there till six in the morning and then go to recovery parties all day. You know, it was just a, there was no respite for my nervous system and it really started to give me some very strong warning signals that I needed to change what I was doing, um, which led to a lot of anxiety, insomnia, and then eventually panic attacks, depression. And, uh, you know, it's a full blown nervous breakdown, you know, eventually. Uh, so it was at that point that I was kind of pushed into a choiceless position by my body to say enough's enough to you better start doing something different because we ain't taking this anymore yeah yeah and then how did uh, meditation present itself uh back then it was in the 90s and there was no google to try and google out of that problem so uh i was watching a lot of tv i developed agoraphobia so i was at home watching tv and then i um I saw on a TV show a guy that was meditating and he was sitting in a chair in a suit and it was not the normal meditation that I'd come to think of. And I was working at that point in time in my life it wearing suits and I thought, well, this guy's not in Lotus. He's not holding hands in mudras. He was just sitting comfortably in a chair and wearing a suit and he was meditating. He was actually a property developer. Uh, and, and I was really impressed with what he was doing. It looked like it was something that I could do. It was an alien. Mm. And I got very excited by that. So I picked up the phone book, uh, the old yellow pages back then before we had Google. And I started to look through under M for meditation in my local area. And I just basically rang all the meditation centers and I turned up night after night to different meditation centers, looking at different techniques. And a lot of them I didn't really resonate with. There was nothing wrong with them. They just weren't the vibe that I was looking for and they weren't really cutting to the chase. But then I, I, I found one that was taught by a neuroscientist. He was, dressed very smartly in no sort of hippie clothes. And he was talking a lot of science and it really, it just resonated a lot with my brain at that point in time. And, and who was that? Do you want to give him a shout out? Yeah. There's a man called Tom Knowles. He's actually here in Australia at the moment. He's an American who was living in a suburb of Sydney at the time. And he was a great teacher, a very profound man and probably one of the, the great orators of Vedic philosophy in our world today. Mm. A great deal of respect for him. And uh, yeah, it was a life changing experience learning meditation from him. And you would have been used to picking up the phone book and ringing people. Yeah. <laughs> nice transference of the, of the <clears throat> habit yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And for you, what's it been like the journey of meditation? Was that something that, had, you know, did you see immediate benefit? Did you take a while to see benefit? Uh, was it a struggle? Have you stuck with it for, since then? Have you had times where you haven't done it at all? And yeah, tell us a little bit about the journey going forward. Yeah, it's been 21 years now. Um, I've never once deviated. It's, it's, there were times when uh, I was challenged by the process of the unstressing that I was going through um, because meditation is not a straight line or the, the results of meditation is not a straight line either. And so there were times when there was uh, a lot of unraveling of stresses that were quite confronting and challenging. And even to this day, 20 years later, there's still stresses unraveling. You know, it's, you go through some challenging times at times and and that's part of the, the journey of self-discovery. Meditation is just the tool to help you do that. Um, but I, I have consistently meditated every day for 21 years now. And mm. uh, it was from the get-go, it was very profound. You know, that first week, I wouldn't say the first week was enjoyable. There was a lot of stress coming out, but it was definitely profound. There was definitely change that was happening. And that change was really uh, it's quite significant that first week. First few weeks was very significant. Mm. <clears throat> so you felt immediate benefit absolutely yeah. Mm. yeah and and what in terms of the, the insomnia the, the agoraphobia all of that stuff how did it affect that yeah the insomnia was probably one of the first things to go away i found that um the what happens when you start meditating quite quickly even today you know i was teaching people for the first time and they were falling asleep in their meditation and that's that body immediately moving out of fight flight sympathetic nervous system state and across into parasympathetic so the body in fight flight can't produce or doesn't produce much melatonin. You know, it's just not safe when you're in a dangerous situation to fall asleep. So the body protects itself by reducing the melatonin production, which is why we've got a lot of insomnia in our world today. Uh, a lot of people are in fight flight. And when we go into the deep restful state of meditation, when the mind is still, the body is no longer making judgment about whether there's a, a bad situation or not. The body's no longer 
processing whether this is dangerous. It's just still there's a presence. And because of that, the body then recognises the anomaly of fatigue in the system and it starts to produce melatonin. So for me, the insomnia went away. Like that week, I was falling asleep everywhere. It was crazy. I, you know, I, just, I was so excited to lie on a sofa on a Saturday afternoon and fall asleep. That never happened to me before. You know, it's phenomenal. Um, so, yeah, the insomnia is probably one of the first things I found. The, things like the depression and anxiety started to lift within the first few weeks. You know, started just generally feeling lighter. Mm. It was really tangible, very profound. I went back to work and um, it was just noticing a, a sense of stability, you know, and a sense of just feeling lighter. Mm. And then the, I guess the, what I'm, what I'm thinking about is the, the rave culture getting caught up in that. How did that shift post meditation or how, how did that all uh, yeah you know it's not immediate you know it's it's a gradual thing you know you, you, it's hard to change a, a deep culture that you're in with a lot of your friendships and things like that are, are deep in that so um the first thing that i i changed was the drug use i i stopped that immediately uh, i found the effect that was having on my nervous system was so uh damaging uh and the, and the environment as well i found after meditating that i, I really just felt a, a great deep sense of respect for my my body and you know i'm not against the rape culture i love music and i love dancing so um but what i found was the the negative effect that was having on my nervous system and, and the anxiety that it was leading to it was so phenomenal it was just a preference i just didn't want to experience that anymore mm. <clears throat> so i dropped the drug use straight away uh it was just too much damage on my nervous system for me and the, the, what was happening with the meditation was that was all healing. You know, a doctor can't heal your nervous system. You can't go to a hospital and say, hey, can you fix my nervous system? Mm. But the body can heal the nervous system. Deep rest can heal the nervous system. And it can change your responsiveness to life circumstances. Doctor can't do that. They can give you drugs, but they can't do that. But you can do that. Your body can do that. Mm. And that's what meditation started to do. I found that through the deep rest in meditation, I was finding I was having very different responses to life. And that changed the decision-making process. So um, obviously over time, you know, the, the drinking culture started to fade as well. You know, even that itself was not something that I was drawn to anymore. You know, I feel like having earlier nights and reading good books and meditating and just you find what happens is that every action is motivated by that search to be fulfilled. You know, everyone on the planet's doing the same thing right now and that's looking for fulfillment no matter what we're doing. Mm. We're, we're in that quest to be fulfilled. and there I was with all those actions that weren't leading me to fulfillment. I was chronically depressed. So I, I, it was just obvious. I just had to do something different than what I was doing. And meditation was leading to a deeper sense of fulfillment. So I was really drawn to that and that lifestyle. Well, another, I don't know if that was Einstein, but doing the, the same thing. Same thing over and over again, expect a different result. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> <clears throat> and is that sort of your background? Is the neuroscience or the science your background apart from the, the broking and the finance stuff or? So not really. I just, I just resonated with it. You know, it's just practical, you know, it's my practical brain just really, uh, you know, I'm, I've got a retreat coordinator that comes with me on our retreats and she's amazing. And she laughs at the fact that I'm not that much into woo woo. And she's quite into woo woo, you know, the, the woo woo side of the spiritual world. And I'm a bit more practical. But. So, so what's your take on things like the secret? Yeah. I'm, all that stuff. I, you know, I totally concur with, you know, it's, it's law of attraction. It's definitely, um, I'm the, big believer in in what we feel is what we attract and there's a sanskrit phrase yat bhavam tat bhavati yat bhavam tat, tat bhavati what we think we become mm. so this stuff's been around for thousands of years this is a, that's an ancient sanskrit phrase you know thousands of years old so uh, i think the secret was just mainstreaming so you know science i guess mm. <clears throat> and for you you've had a few teachers you so you've had uh, some different meditation teachers have you and you're stuck with the one kind of path once you once you found one that works um do you suggest also for people to, to shop around until they find one that resonates you know a technique or a method that works for them um and what's the, the benefit of i guess sticking with one versus trying many sure. different things uh firstly i'll just say that uh you know I, i'm being taught every day um, i'm always a student i'm always learning my kids are teachers my partner's a teacher um, you know, my students are teachers, you know, life is my teacher. I'm, I'm, I'm learning and there's, I don't believe we ever get to a point of fully knowing. Um, I think there's always, while we're here in human form, there's always something for us to learn. Mm. So um, that's an ongoing process for me. Um, I've had one meditation practice, which is 
sort of grown and evolved over time, one tradition, but I believe in a holistic approach. So I, I don't believe there's one thing that's a cure all as well. Um, the meditation didn't get me to where I am. The meditation was part of the, the, the apparatuses that I've used along the way, you know, green smoothies have helped me and going to bed early and yoga's helped me and Qigong and every now and then I use a healer and every now and then I'll get some Cairo done and every now and then I'll, I don't know, I get coaching from people and, you know, it's, it's been a journey that's constantly looking to um, tune into what's needed at any given time to assist me on my path. Yeah. But I do and, believe in a holistic approach, mind, body and spirit. And as in paying attention to those areas and, and, and addressing them uh, as, you know, as per necessary. Yeah, you know, I, you know I, had, I had coaching a while back from one woman and it was profound and it was, it was to the point and it was after three sessions, like, okay, I got it, you know, I, I totally get it at this point in time, that's what I needed. And now it's time for me to integrate that. She's like, cool, you know, that was profound that you were able to cognize that that quickly and, and learn to integrate. So that was about not getting attached. It's like, you know, um, say to my students, you know, the best thing I can do is render you self-sufficient of my need, of my attention. Mm. And it's like a cast on a leg, you know, at, at that particular point in time, that cast on the leg is the most profound thing you can do um, <laughs> to stabilize the leg from, you know, getting severely defected. Uh, but if we get really attached to the cast and think that the cast saved us, it didn't. The cast just created stability while the leg healed itself. Mm. The cast didn't do any healing whatsoever. It just creates a stable environment for the healing process to take action. Mm. And this is what I see all of my, those modalities are. They're just vehicles, casts or forms of stability so that what can actually be experienced is truth, you. And, um, and uh, you know, along the way if, if we get attached to anything that we revere as the the source you the source is within us mm. and um yeah if we got attached to that cast and don't want to ever take it off our leg i'm not oh, this cast i'm just so attached to it. i love it you know the thing that helped your leg heal will eventually cause gangrene and you eventually have to lose the leg <laughs> and, and i do see that with uh some people get so attached to the modality and so reverent and there's lots of idolatry, whether it's a teacher or a modality. And I, I'm, you know, uh, I, I never would want to, I never promote that as an idea. So by meditating every day for 21 years, is that not a, a cast that you're, that you kind of attached to in some way? Or? As long as you recognize that the effectiveness of what that's doing and recognizing that it's not the actual meditation that is what I'm looking for. Mm. Meditation allows me in this incredibly turbulent time um, and this incredibly busy time that I have in my life. I'm producing feature films. I'm being a father of children and a partner and, uh, you know, develop houses and I coach people and I write books and I, you know, I'm doing a million things, uh, you know, Saturday afternoon, teaching people to meditate, doing Skype calls at Saturday evening, um, picking up kids at 10 o'clock tonight from parties and meditation helps me amongst that turbulence, mm. just find an inner stillness. It's the pathway to stillness. And uh, I like to reconnect daily to that stillness. Mm. Um, and that's what I use meditation for. But uh, what I'm reverent of is the inner stillness, not the meditation. Yep, yep. Amazing. And it's, it's what I'm hearing there is it's a sort of path to effectiveness as well. So that stillness. Yeah allows you to be effective in all that you have going on. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's what I love as well. I love, yes, I love yes. the using the technique or the, the method or the practice, not just for the practice sake, and I'm not getting attached to the practice, but actually then now that I've, I've sat in the moment, in the present, and I have this space, you know, I feel like it creates space for me to, mm. to choose and have options rather than being bombarded by all the stuff. And I feel like I'm cramped into a corner of my mind and I, I'm under weight. But when, when I come back to the stillness, I'm, I'm open and I can have mm. choice amongst all of this stuff. So then actually I can direct my awareness, my attention on what it needs to be. And, and yeah, that's, that's yeah. what I, I thoroughly love about it. And then for me, just doing it and getting attached to the practice is kind of defeats the purpose. It's like, all right, now, now that you have stillness, what are you going to do with this mm. present? What are you going to do with this awareness? And, and you get to put the intention and the attention yeah. out there to do something with. 
Yeah, I just want to clarify when I was saying not the, I wasn't referring to the practices, the caste, I was referring to the guru, uh, mm. the guru worship um, because it's like cleaning your teeth, brushing your teeth. You know, I'll brush my teeth for my entire life. I'm not attached to it like a caste. It's just a great prevention. <laughs> um, and that's why yoga, meditation, eating well, meditating, uh, you know, exercising, all that stuff is, is, is something that I'll do all my life. It's what, I, what I'm really excited by is when a student comes to me and I teach them to meditate. And over time, I teach them how to find self-sufficiently that knowledge within them. Mm. Um, and then I see them becoming teachers of some sort, you know, they're either psychologists or they're meditation teachers or yogis and, and they're out with their own students. And, and that to me is, it's just amazing, you know, that they've, they've, they've got what they needed and they've moved on, you know, mm. and I find that that's, that's what's great is to see people <clears throat> becoming proud and self-sufficient. And, you know, like I said, teachers are everywhere around me all the time. Um, and that's sometimes that, 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 that attachment, to, to the one oracle can actually limit our ability to see all the knowledge around us. Yeah. It's like the G, the G Kundo method with Bruce Lee. It's like okay. taking the best parts of yeah, right. you know, Beautiful. everything and, and coming up with your own uh, modality. Yeah. 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 Nice. Something I can relate to too, in terms of, uh, I used to do a lot of healing. So a lot of physical healing, massage and energetic healing. And a lot of the, my clients would come and and they would only come three, four times and go, Oh my God, all my things are fixed. I don't, you know, it's not just like, they're like, I don't need it. Like maybe it's rather than coming once a week, they'll come once a month and then once every two months because yeah. the work I'm doing is actually working. And I'm thinking to myself, is this bad practice in terms of business? Or <laughs> it's not such a great way to go about it. It is actually to sort the problem out, go to the core, but it is actually because then the feedback, you know, the yeah. feedback that they're giving is, oh my God, this, I can do it within myself, you know, give them the tools to actually go uh, and, and be able to sort themselves out, essentially. Um, moving on, you just mentioned all the stuff you're doing, feature film, write books, uh, running retreats. T- tell us a, a bit more about these things. Yeah, we have a diverse sort of range of offerings for our, our tribe. And that's because it's like Apple, you know, you go walk in the Apple store and you can get phone charges, you can get Macs, you can get, uh, you know, desktops, you can get iPhones. And there's, you know, different people that have different needs. So, you know, we've got, uh, you know, really entry level meditation, $9 MP3s. We've got, you know, online programs. We've got weekend workshops. Uh, we've got six day retreats in Bali. We just had a couple of weeks ago. We've got a four-day retreat up in Byron Bay in northern New South Wales in November. Um, so these are, you know, students that have come through, done our weekend workshop or our online program, giving them that opportunity to go deeper into that practice, deeper into that, uh, I guess, that healing process um, and providing avenues for them to do that. We've got books that people can read and then we've got uh, entrepreneurial coaching programs for people who want to actually step into this space as a transformational leader and step up into the world and, and take that wisdom and knowledge and help them form structures. And, um, you know, a lot of them come to me saying, you know, I'm really excited about sharing with the world. I want to give the world my love and my knowledge. It's like, okay, how are you going to do that? How are they going to make a valuable exchange and tangibly quantify what it is you've got to offer so they can put a price point on that and make an exchange. So you, and, you know, one of my uh, members when they were coming into the Zen Academy said, well, it's not about the money, Tom. I said, well, if you don't know how to make money out of this, you're going to be working seven days a week and, you know, back in the job that you don't like that you're trying to get out of because the whole point of you coming here was that you wanted to find a way to sustainably do what you love and that's bring your message to the world in a way that allows you to do it full time. And, and if you can't find a structured way to do it, I guess, you know, I had 26 years in finance, so it's probably a, <laughs> every chance I was going to bring that into it. But, you know, we're, we're not apologetic about... Um, bringing the responsibility of trying to find a business model that works as a transformational leader, because that allows you to have leverage. It allows you to commit full time to it and, and reach further afield and impact more people's lives than if you're trying to do it two nights a week after you've just finished a 12 hour day as a lawyer. (laughs) 100%. And in, in that, in, in being able to reach more people and impact more people, how is the, mission of uh, reaching a billion people how, how's that going like where are you at with that how many people have you reached so far and how do you plan on on reaching these billion people yeah it's an interesting one to try and quantify you know it's uh, we initially had our tagline stillness project inspiring a million people to meditate daily and um i had some really good coaches around the establishment of that and they said you know i i think you're 
underplaying it, you know, like that, that you could reach that quite quickly. And funnily enough, um, within four years of, of uh, setting our mission of 1 billion, um, you know, we'd, we'd been launched through Mind Valley uh, as a meditation coach to 2 million of their subscribers. Um, we've been, you know, out to mind movies and, um, you know, about to put out a feature film globally. Um, so, you know, our reach has been quite substantial um, as far as how many people have actually started meditating from what we do. We've certainly changed quite a lot of people's lives. We've had thousands and thousands of testimonials of people who have done our online program, now weekend workshops and retreats. Um, but the beauty of having such a big mission is that it's going to keep me going for a little while. I wouldn't want it to be over in the first three years. Otherwise, I had nothing else to do. Maybe I'll go and work in a grocery store. Who knows? <laughs> Just dream-based. I like it. So the feature film, what is it and what's it about? What's, who's, it, who's involved in it? Uh, do, you got some... Uh, yeah, some yeah, we've got a great crew. Info that you can share with us. Yeah, it was originally called Superhuman, currently called The Portal. And we're exploring through the format of stillness uh, life on the other side of the world of duality. What will we access when we go into stillness? What's available there when we transcend the limitations of mind and body? And how through these amazing stories that we'll be conveying in the film, how, how much that uh, brings transformation. So, yeah, excited to bring that out to the world. They'll be out in 2018. Amazing. So just quickly touch on that. What is the, the world of non-duality for those uh, unfamiliar with this, these concepts? Yeah, it, it's a space where the egoic identity has dissolved and you're experiencing simple awareness or presence without the uh, experience of form. And we're in the field of formlessness, boundarylessness, as like a student said the other day when they came out of meditation for the f second time, this was on their workshop and the second meditation, they came out and they said, I don't know where I was just then, but wherever it was, I want to go back because that was phenomenal. And the reason they don't know where they were because they couldn't quantify it because there was no form to quantify. Mm. There was no, even today, you know, someone said they, they, they felt like a, there was, their body had dissolved. Mm. And, uh, and that's the world of non-dual, where there's no longer me and something else. So all of our charges, our emotions are a response of me interacting with something else. And that something else is having an effect, an impression on me in, in the non-dual state through, through into stillness if that doesn't exist. Mm. It's, it's just be beingness or bliss. Yeah, it does feel pretty blissful, doesn't it? Mm. Mm. And like you said, life, death. Definitely becomes the meditation. How, how it's affected uh, you in these ways. So you have many students who come. What are the sort of, whether it's ailments or issues or problems or situations mm -hmm. that people come with um, and then they come and they might listen to a, a, an MP3, they might come and do a weekend uh, workshop, they might come and do a retreat with you. What's the sort of, yeah, they come with, X, they, they come and do work with you and then they leave with Y. Like what's, what's the sort of uh, common sure. themes or threads that happen? Yeah, generally most people come to me pushed by pain with pain points just as I started my journey with a pain point. Uh, you know, it's, I, there's, there's an ailment, there's an anomaly here that I need to eradicate. Yeah, generally most of it today's world is anxiety, mm. insomnia, depression, predominantly anxiety. Uh, there's an intense... And anxiety is a, like, do you know the neuroscience behind anxiety? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Or Yeah, it's, it's just a sustained level of uh, fight flight. Yeah. You know, there's, there's just, they're just generally in a state of constant fear, uh, fear around their financial situations, fear around what people think of them, fear around their job, fear around their partner leaving them. There's so much fear in our world today. That's a, a hyperactive and overactive uh, yeah, yeah. system. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So just chronic states of high levels of cortisol and adrenaline pumping through their body, very little serotonin, oxytocin, melatonin. Um, so that's generally the first point that people will come to me. Um, what we find in meditation very quickly is they get out of sympathetic into parasympathetic. Um, so they, we start to see a reduction in those fight-flight symptoms. Um, and this is within so minutes of like the first the first session I have with you. Yeah, you know, definitely in, in the meditation, the first and second meditation, we're noticing significant changes. Um, by the end of the workshop, we're definitely noticing. I had a guy ring me yesterday from last weekend's workshop 
rang me last night and said, man, this is life changing. I'm totally addicted. I can't believe how much this has changed my life. And he had chronic anxiety. Um, so look at, you know, I'm not going to, um, beef that up too much because, you know, it doesn't mean you suddenly become this utopian enlightened monk, you know, um, you, you still have experiences of, of challenge, you know, there's no question about it. Um, there's definitely a significant experience noticed for most meditators of this technique quite early on in the piece, but, uh, life's an interesting journey and, and that journey continues on. So, you know, we, we continue to face challenges and we just get more equipped with dealing with them. hundred mm, percent. And I'm curious to know what has stood out for you in terms of your teachers uh, that you've worked with, whether it's been you know, autobiographies or books you've read or actually uh, teachers you've worked with. What has stood out, maybe the top three things that have stood out that you've remembered um, that, you know, in knowledge or wisdom that they've instilled upon you? Oh, gosh, there's so much. My goodness, I've read so many books. And so many <laughs> um, right. Now. Look, I mean, there's, there's a couple of books I would say that have left really profound impressions on me. One was called Emmanuel's book, which is... Uh, Emmanuel? Emmanuel, yeah. Emmanuel's book is just up there in my number one book, I'd say, out of my many books. Um, there's another great book called Oneness by Rasha, R-A-S-H-A, is incredibly profound. Um, the Bhagavad Gita, obviously, was a, a profound read for me. Um, the most significant thing has been connecting to source daily. Um, you know, I'm not a religious person, but, uh, you know, I, I look into all modalities of religion and what inspires those religions. So I constantly explore, you know, pe what people are doing out there, you know, religions, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Kabbalah, uh, you know, they all offer something profound. And it's like you said about being, was it uh, Thingy Lee, Bruce Lee? Bruce taking Lee. Things, you, know? you know, I just really like that. So that's kind of what I've done all along, you know. Um, a teacher that I learned meditation from, Tom Knowles, taught me what's called the Exploring the Vedas, which was uh, a seven weekend course of deep exploration into Vedic wisdom. And I would say that would, has been the most profound thing that I've done in, in my time. That was a, a course run by him? Yeah, Exploring the Vedas. Something uh, he doesn't run to? Uh, he only did it once and then you can get recordings of it now. Yeah, it awesome. was pretty phenomenal. Yeah, I learned it with him in person. Amazing. And, and what's exciting you or, you know, what's, what's on the, obviously we've got the feature film um, going forward. What's, uh, what are you most looking forward to? Yeah, you know, it's funny what excites me, you know, what excites me is picking up my kids on Saturday night, you know, uh, watching the sunrise and I, you know, I'm finding life, I'm drawn more and more to simplicity. It's, it's phenomenal how I'm, sat in a church the other day that I was walking past and I got pulled into the drawer as I just was walking past and I thought I want to go in there. and I sat there for two hours and it was, it was just profound and, and it was just beautiful. Um, as far as mission goes, um, you know, the film and coaching and retreats are all what I love speaking. I'm doing a lot of speaking now, public speaking, uh, a lot of speaking gigs. So I enjoy, yeah, sharing, sharing what I've accessed and what I've learned and hopefully inspiring people to find that love, that open heart within them and that compassion. Beautiful. And, and how can people find you? Like where, are you? where are you speaking next and where are you running retreats? And Yeah, yeah we've got Byron Bay in November, um, which is a four-day retreat wow. at the foothills of Mount Warning, which is going to be beautiful in the forest there. Um, and it's all on our website at stillnessproject.com and tomcronin.com. Beautiful. And uh, just finally, thank you so much for your time. I thoroughly appreciate <laughs> you spending your Saturday evening with me. Um, oh, that's great. I love being here. Just, uh, yeah, what's one little, maybe a question you want to ask, a last little kind of sign off that you'd love to leave the listeners with, uh, just leave this space for you to, to have a final little bit of that salt bay to sprinkle on, on our episode. Yeah, little sweet candy. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the thing comes off is that, you know, it's, it's going to be an intense time ahead for everyone. It, it is getting more and more intense and, and we haven't seen anything yet to what we're going to see. And, the one thing that gets us through difficult times, it always comes back to one thing for me is how much can I embody love in this moment? How much can I just simply be love? Forget the looking for it. Forget the search out there, but how much can I just simply be love, you know? And, and that always helps me get through difficult times and keep it really simple like that. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you so and much. When, when, yeah. Cool, man.
And go Thanks. on, I interrupted you, go on. Yeah, I was just going to say, when, when, when we come back to that, it's remarkable how much more at peace and how simple things become. Yeah, it totally is. <laughs> I totally, I, I can attest to that for sure. It's be, being in that love is an incredible thing. Yeah. Exploring that. Thank you so much, brother. Let's do it again sometime. I thoroughly yeah. appreciate you. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. I'm sure we'll uh, see more of each other. We'll do it again sometime. Indeed. Always here for you. Thanks, brother. Cool, man. Rock on.